Well, good morning and welcome to our service from Libanus Church. I'm going to begin just as a time of prayer as we focus ourselves on the God who speaks today. Father, we just pray now that you would be with us, giving us strength, giving us encouragement, giving us the support and help that we need. We pray, Lord, as we think about the big truths this morning, we pray that you will help us. We pray that your spirit will be active and we pray that we would be spiritually moved by what we hear. Speak to your people today. Amen. Well, I've just got two announcements this morning. And the first announcement is to thank uh, Chris Hess for coming and for bringing us God's word this evening. I know uh, for many of us in the church, we don't uh, need any introduction to Chris Hess. And so Chris is coming and he's bringing us God's word in the evening. So please do pray for Chris and pray for the words that he would bring. Pray for him as he opens up God's word that he might preach truth and preach it with power from the Holy Spirit. So please do remember Chris in prayer for this evening. And then just as we continue to pray for Morriston, the three streets we're praying for this week. Uh, Witch Tree Street, Ash Street and Towie Street. So please do remember all three of those streets as we continue to pray that the people of Witch Tree Street, of Ash Street and of Towie Street will find in Jesus hope where maybe they've lost all hope in life. Maybe they've been run down by the coronavirus. Pray that in Jesus they will find the answer to their misery, an answer to their lost life. We're going to have our opening hymn now, and it's a, a hymn that reminds us of the one that we're here to gather around, the one that we're here to be in the midst of. And uh, it's a fairly uh, modern hymn. We're going to sing Only a Holy God.
We're going to continue in worship by praying now to that almighty, holy God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that your kingdom is forever. We thank you that your truths are forever. We thank you that you will never pass away. We thank you that your empire will never fade. We thank you that we can depend on you through everything and in everything. As we look around us, Lord, we're constantly reminded by the ever-changing, ever-fluctuating nature of life. We know that nothing stays the same, nothing lasts. Everything we have fades, but we thank you that if we cling to you, you last. The truth about Jesus Christ, we thank you that it is an eternal truth. We thank you that we haven't got to be worried that we might lose Jesus Christ. We haven't got to be worried that you won't be strong enough to last through the years. We haven't got to be worried that you might change your mind about us. We thank you for the assurance that we can have as Christians. We thank you that as Christians, we can rest firmly on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the great hymn which reminds us that on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Lord, as everything else crumbles away, as the world is unpredictable, the truths about Jesus Christ are our rock. They are our strength. And Lord, we just pray now that for everyone who is struggling at the moment, for everyone who is feeling beaten down for everyone who has had a difficult week. We pray that they would know that Christ is their rock. We know, we pray, Lord, that they might find a foothold on solid ground, ground that is firm, ground that they can put their trust in, for we know that you are a God worth trusting in. We thank you that everything you say is true. We thank you that there are no lies found in you. We thank you that nothing you ever say is false or turns out to be a lie. We thank you that every word of God is dependable. And on that we base our faith. On the words of you who's never broken a promise. The almighty king who keeps every promise he's ever made. And we just praise you for the absolute confidence that all of us can have as we approach you in prayer. We thank you that your promises are forever. Your promises are always kept. And we pray now for our service today that you would speak, that you would be clearly present, clearly visible. We pray, Lord, that the, the hand of the almighty God might be seen by all of us. We pray that all of us might be able to know, to feel, to experience what it is for God himself to speak to us. Father, we pray that you would have mercy on us. Take pity on your people. Your small church in a small town, in a small country, have mercy on us. Revive your church. Set your church on fire. Point us towards Jesus Christ. Help us to focus. Lord, if there's any distractions in our minds or in our hearts, Lord, we pray that you will get rid of them. We pray that we will be able to focus on him. Help us to focus on Christ Jesus and on Christ alone. Be with us now throughout the entirety of the service. Amen. We're now going to have our reading, which is taken from John's Gospel and chapter 8. The reading today is taken from John chapter 8 and starting at verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Before I come and I bring God's word to us, we're just going to sing another hymn that reminds us that there is no other way that we can be saved except Jesus. We're going to sing, You Alone Can Rescue. Nobody else has that power to rescue. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. I'm just going to pray for God's presence as we proclaim his word. Let's pray. Father, I just pray now that the words that I speak will be words from you. Words of life, words of power, words of encouragement, words of rebuke. Father, I pray that you will have a message for every single person who watches this sermon. I pray that you will have something for them, a message for them. An encouragement for them, correction for them. Father, we are desperate to hear your voice. Speak to your people. Amen. Now, what I want us to be looking at this morning is what is a true Christian? This is the question that I want us to answer. This is what I want us to think about. What is it to be a true Christian? Now, I've had a letter recently uh, this week and I'm sure many of you will have had this letter and if you haven't had this letter you'll be getting it in the next few weeks and months and I've had a letter from the census it's that time again where we have to all fill in our census forms and one of the questions that you're always asked on your form is what is your religion what is your religious belief and what we see so often is people always write 
that I am a Christian. And so many people say that they are Christians on the census form. And many people will say, oh, I'm a Christian without really thinking about it. Many people will say they're a Christian because they were baptised as a baby. Many people will say they're a Christian because their family has been Christian. Many people say they are Christian because once in a while they go to church at Christmas and Easter. Some people will say, well, I've, I've read the Bible in the past, and so I, I must be a Christian. This is a, a crucial issue. There is no question that is more important than being able to answer this. Are you a Christian? And so at a time when so many people are going to be talking about how they are Christians, they're going to be writing it down and telling the government that they're Christians. I wonder, are you truly a Christian? Do you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus? J.C. Ryle, a great theologian, he once said, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but he once said that the most dangerous position to be in is to be inclined to Jesus, to be halfway to Jesus, but not having embraced him. And so the most important question for all of us comes down to, do we truly know what a Christian is? And do we truly know that I am a Christian? That's the question I want you all to be thinking about this morning. And so we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. And my first point from John 8 and verse 31 my first point is about how everybody watching this video, everybody who is watching this video can be set free. And so my first point is to be set free. And we begin this narrative in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him. Now what we have here is we have a reminder that when Jesus came, he was teaching primarily to the Jewish people. And we have this reminder in Romans 1. Romans 1 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And this is the great news about Jesus. It is for everyone. Everyone who is watching this video, you can know what it is to be set free. The, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is for everybody who believes. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't matter how much you've got in the bank. It doesn't even matter what you've done wrong in your life. Everybody who comes to Jesus can be set free. Now Jesus continues in verse 31 and Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Now what we are told here is that we need to abide in the words of Jesus. The true mark of a disciple of Jesus is not just somebody who thinks about Jesus once in a while, every now and then. It's not just somebody who goes to church every Sunday and then lives a completely different life than next. We are called to abide in his word. We are called to, to love his word, to rest on his words. Because the words of Jesus, for Christians, they're so precious. Because they are our hope to be saved. They are our hope to set us free. I wonder, can it be said of your life, in your spiritual walk, are you abiding in the words of Jesus? Are you trusting in God's message? And the problem is, is that there's passages of the Bible that are really hard. There are passages of the Bible that are difficult. There are some passages of the Bible that affect us. There are parts of the Bible where Jesus tells us not to do things that we quite like to do. There are bits of the Bible that are hard teachings, difficult things that strike too close to home. 
There are things in the Bible that mean that we need to change the way that we live our life. We need to correct ourselves so that we are living in a way that Christ would want us to live. We must embrace the entirety, the whole counsel of God, the fullness of his word. We must keep the words of Jesus close to us. We must keep the words of God close to us. And that means even the bits we don't like, we still have to abide in. We still have to follow. We still have to trust in. But we are presented with an even starker reality. Jesus continues now in verse 32. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And there is a vital truth here. If you don't grasp anything from this video except this, this is the key thing for you to understand. If this is the only thing you understand, I want you to grasp this. This is an exclusionary statement. This statement by Jesus excludes a lot of people. And so often as Christians, we, we don't like to think about that. We don't want to dwell on that. We want to focus on how Jesus is for the Jew and the Greek. He's for people of every nationality. But we need to understand that if the truth of Jesus Christ is found in his words, if that is the mark of a true disciple, someone who abides in his word, abides in his teachings, we need to understand that if you do not know Jesus, then you do not know the truth. That is what Jesus is saying. The truth about Jesus is what will set you free. And so if you do not know the truth about Jesus, then you do not know truth. This world is so hard, isn't it? You don't know who to listen to, who to follow. And it are coming up in May, there's an election. And so often people never know which politician to trust. Which politician is going to do what they say they're going to do. It's so hard, isn't it, to find someone who is telling the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ needs to be embraced. And if you do not know the truth of Jesus Christ, then you do not know truth. And we need to be absolutely honest and upfront as Christians with people. In our evangelism, we need to be honest and we need to say that what Jesus says is true. And what Jesus says is, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. And that's the gospel. The gospel is only through Jesus Christ can you be set free. That is why we need him. There is no other way to get to God who is perfect without Jesus. And if you think in your life that you don't need Jesus, if you think he's optional, if you think he might be for some but not for me, then that is a lie. And you do not know the truth. And all of us need to desperately ensure that we understand the truth about Jesus. And why is it so important? Why is it so important that we understand this? Because it is only the truth of Jesus that can set you free. Nothing else offers you freedom. Nothing else has the power to set you free. You are a captive. You are a slave. You don't have freedom. You're not living the way that God created you to live. And it is only by embracing Jesus Christ that you can have true freedom in your life. This is the reality that we proclaim as Christians. And so many of us might know what that's like. Many of us might feel trapped. Some of us might feel trapped in our jobs. I think we all feel a little bit trapped in our houses, don't we? Sure, maybe we're trapped in our emotions. Maybe feel, we feel like we're in an emotional rut. Maybe we just feel like we're trapped doing the same mundane things again and again. And we need to understand that freedom cannot be achieved by you. You cannot find freedom in, in yourself. You cannot find freedom in yourself. The only single way to be free is to believe 
upon Jesus. My second point continues on this theme, this freedom. As we're going to look at my second point, the slave freed. Now in the narrative, the people who are listening to Jesus, they're utterly confused. And in verse 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? What they're basically saying in this passage is, how can I be set free? I'm already free. There's nothing I need freedom for. I'm fine the way I am. And this is something crucial for evangelism. Before people embrace Jesus, they first need to understand that they are locked in captivity. Before people accept that they need to be saved by Jesus, they have to accept that they need saving. And this question is being asked by the people is, what do we need freedom for? Well, what are we currently trapped in? What are we stuck in? What occupies our lives? And in verse 34, we see Jesus' answer. This is what Jesus says everyone is trapped in. And Jesus answered them saying, truly, truly. Now, I love this phrase because we've just spoken about truth. And everything that Jesus says is true. Nothing that Jesus has ever said is a lie. Everything Jesus has ever said, every promise he has ever made is true. You can depend on him, for he does not lie. So when Jesus says truly, truly, this must mean something that we have to listen to. It reminds me a little bit when I was at school. When I was at school, I'd be daydreaming, I'd be looking up at the ceiling, I wouldn't be concentrating. I might even be doodling if I was sitting quite far at the back. And then all of a sudden the teacher would say one phrase and everyone in the class would look up and pay attention. And the teacher would simply say, this is going to be on the exam. And everyone in the classroom would look up and suddenly start writing down and paying attention. Everything else the teacher was saying was vitally important, but this was more important. I think it's the same for Jesus. What Jesus is saying here is everything I've said has been true, but truly, truly. Other translations have verily, verily. This you need to you need to wake up and pay attention to. You listening to the sermon, you need to pay attention to the next words that Jesus says. Verse 34. I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, some of us might be sitting there thinking, well, well, I don't practice sin. I'm a master at it. I'm an expert at sin. Because we know this so well. I mean, let's be honest with one another. Let's be fairly open in this video. I know that greed is wrong. I know that gluttony is wrong. But if I see an open pack of biscuits, no matter how many biscuits are left, I am going to finish that tin. I'm sure many of you are the same. When the treats are sitting there, they're staring at you, they're tempting you, and you know you shouldn't. But it tastes so good. And that's a trivial example. It's a frivolous example. But it's something really important. And I think we understand it. We understand that sometimes we don't want to do what is wrong. None of us want to do what is wrong. We're all trying to live good lives. And yet we all fall down. We all, sure, we all fall short. We all fail. It's interesting when uh, people sometimes break their, uh, their marriage vows, when people have affairs, some of the phrases people often say and they often use are things like, it was an accident. I didn't mean to. I couldn't, ha I couldn't help it. It just happened. These are some of the phrases, some of the excuses that people use for, for such a, a terrible thing that they do. 
And we understand that on some level, we are entrapped and enslaved by sin. Now, you might not have committed adultery, but we've all done something wrong. We all know that lying is wrong. And yet we do it because it's easier for us. We've all done things wrong. And what the Bible says is that if you practice sin, if you've ever done something wrong, then you are a slave to it. The reason why you do things wrong is because you can't stop doing things wrong. Have you ever tried to, to just stop doing everything wrong? Have you ever said, right, from now on, I'm going to do everything right? And I wonder how long it took you to fail. Probably about 10 minutes if you're anything like me. We have to accept that we are enslaved to sin. We can't get out of it. We can't get around it. However small, however big, we are enslaved to the things that we've done wrong. But this is a, a really important point, and I want to stress this. You might be a slave to sin, but you are still accountable for your sin. Nobody is going to be able to argue. At the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, nobody is going to be able to say, I couldn't help it. It was an accident. I didn't mean to. We are slaves to sin, but we are accountable for the wrong that we do in our lives. We are accountable for our actions. And that is why only Jesus can set us free. Because somebody has to pay the penalty. Somebody has to pay what we owe. In order for us to be forgiven, in order for us to be set free, somebody has to pay that penalty. And if we trust in Jesus, then we are slaves who have been set free. We who once could not get away from the wrong things that we could do. We who could not escape the eternal punishment that was due to us. We have been set free. And when you understand that you have been a slave to your sin, that makes freedom so much better, so much sweeter. And you should be so much more thankful to Jesus Christ for setting you free. And my final point reinforces this. It reinforces the only way that you can be set free is through the son of the father. My third point, the son of the father. This is the only way, verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Jesus continues with this slave analogy and he makes the statement that the slave doesn't stay there forever. The slave, the slave doesn't last. The only thing that lasts, the only thing that stands firm is Jesus, is the son and so if you've done things wrong in your life, you cannot hope to be with God forever. You cannot hope to dwell with him forever. That's what Jesus is making clear. Only the son can be with his father forever. The only thing that we can be certain of in this world that is ever changing, ever fluctuating, the only thing we can be sure of is that forever, Jesus Christ will be in the presence of his father. And that should make sense to us. Of course, Jesus will forever be with God the father. But the reaction should be, what does that mean for me? Where does that leave me? So Jesus is going to be with the father, but, but how can I be with God? What am I going to do? Verse 36 is the answer. The greatest answer. The biggest problem you have, this is the answer to it. Verse 35, the, this, uh, 36, sorry. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Because of the position that the Son has, because of the authority that the Son has, he is on the right hand of the Father. And so the Son can afford to us the right to be set free. More than that, the Bible tells us that we can be adopted into the family of God. 
Only the Son can remain in the presence of the Father forever. And so by dying on the cross, Jesus Christ has done just that. He has welcomed us in to his family. We can be called sons with God and we can last forever. There's no need for us to be swept out. When God, who is a just judge, punishes everything, we can stand firm if we are standing in Jesus Christ. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And this is why we can have such a positive affirmation. If the Son sets you free, there's no question about it. There's no doubt. There's no worry. If he has set you free, you are free indeed. There's no need to second guess. There's no need to constantly be worried. Am I still saved? Does Jesus still love me? If the Son has set you free, if you truly know what it is to be trusting in Christ, if you are a true follower in him, if your faith is in Jesus Christ and what he has done and not in what you are trying to do by being good, then forgiveness can be afforded to you. Now, just as I close, I just want you to notice there's no terms or conditions. There's no caveats. So often on telly, you get a great deal. A big deal will pop up. And then really quickly, there will be all the terms and conditions. And there'll be a voiceover. They'll say everything really fast. Or maybe you've got a, a physical voucher. And you look at the voucher and in, in big letters it says, bargain, money off. And then in really small font, you have to sort of strain your eyes or get a magnifying glass to read the small print to see what the terms and conditions are. There are no terms and conditions for Jesus Christ. For everyone who truly repents and believes in Jesus Christ shall be saved. This is the glory of the gospel. This is the simplicity of the gospel. The world is full of lies and we as Christians need to be up front with people that Jesus Christ offers the truth. It's not debatable. It's not Jesus Christ's truth and the world's truth. It is Christ's truth for that is the only truth. Everything else that contradicts that is a lie. And so if you are truly trusting in the good news of Jesus Christ, in his death on the cross, you can be set free. No matter how much you used to be a slave to sin, no matter how bad you were, there's no terms and conditions. There's no you can be saved as long as you haven't done this. Everyone who is Trusting in Jesus Christ can be set free. And what a way, great way to end my sermon by just to reiterate, just to read verse 36. I wonder, let's worship and glory God today. Let's praise him this morning. Why? Because if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so why not get in touch with us at Libanus Church? If you don't know if you know Jesus Christ, if you've got any questions about the truth of the gospel, please get in touch with us and we'd be happy to answer any questions. And we're going to end our time together now by singing my personal favourite hymn. We're going to sing And Can It Be? And I love And Can It Be? And the uh, one of the great verses in it says, speaking of how we were once imprisoned, but now we are set free. It says, my chains fell off, my heart is free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. I wonder, do you know what it is to be a slave, to be in chains and to have all of it forgiven by Christ? 